Hello, I hope you're doing well and that the semester is going fine. So today we're going to start a new module and it's related to identical particles. And in particular, we're going to start talking about basically the symmetries of the many particle wave functions of identical fermions and bosons. Well, for fermions it's anti-symmetry, for bosons it's symmetry. But yeah, I mean, we'll start by talking about the differences between different particles, how in quantum mechanics, indistinguishable particles, it's in a way different or more restrictive than in the classical case. And then we'll talk uh, simply about um, systems of two identical particles uh, in the case of fermions and bosons, and then their uh, extension to systems of many particles. So let me share the screen to start the lecture. Okay, so again, uh, today we'll start talking about identical particles. Uh, we'll try to focus at the end on anti-symmetry of the many particle wave of identical uh, fermions. But, okay, uh, for the beginning, let's start. Uh, so we have, or we're gonna restrict first to two particle systems and just consider the differences between cases when the particles are different in quantum mechanics versus the case where they are identical. And let's start by first analyzing the case of a system of two different particles. In principle, we let's assume that we know that they're different. They may have different mass, etc. right? And so we can distinguish them. And in this case, we'll have a Hamiltonian um, and we're gonna neglect the interaction between particle one and particle two. So what we have for the Hamiltonian is basically the sum of the respective kinetic energies and the sum of the potentials uh, under each one of them. Since they are not interacting, we don't have a potential that depends on the two particle coordinates. So it's just one potential under which the particle one is and another potential under which the second particle is um, being affected. And well, I mean, mathematically, this is basically gonna constitute the Schrodinger equation where the variables are uh, separable. So you can propose, um, well, okay. In principle, the wave function will be a function of the coordinates of each one of the particles, particle one, particle two, and time. But again, in the case where the particles are not interacting because each term in a way depends on the coordinates this only in particle one and this only in particle two uh, can be solved by separation of variables. And so one possible solution is precisely to propose a product uh, state solution where one uh, factor is a function only of particle one and the other factor is only a solution of particle two. If you do that, uh, you can basically by plugging in and showing your equation and decomposing you'll see that each one of these satisfies showing your equation for uh, one particle functions. And well, I mean, as uh, you are familiar with your DFQ courses, basically these separable solutions uh, can be linearly combined, right? So we could have a linear combination of this type where, I mean, we're assuming that the coefficients are, are non-zero if they are included. And um, well, each one of these uh, sets represents orthonormal sets for the case of particle one, uh, in the case of the subindex A, and uh, particle two in the case of the subindex B. Uh, that is because we're assuming that they could be different in principle, so they could have different or, um, orthonormal sets. So this is a possible solution. Now, um, this is important to mention because there is a definition that is crucial in quantum mechanics and some people call is like the basically fundamental feature of quantum mechanics, which is entanglement. So um, partially related to this, a uh, state is entangled when it cannot be written as a product of single particle states, where basically a formulation like this one cannot happen. So you define entangled by what it cannot be, right? It cannot be a product of state. So in that case, or in the case of our example, we would say that our two particles are entangled and there's a term that uh, Schrodinger invented or 
coined, of course, the German word for it, but uh, this is a new concept that distinguishes quantum from classical mechanics. So this is a broad scope of what happens in the case of uh, different particles, which because they're uh, different can be distinguished. And well, um, uh, let's also consider or at least mention something uh, else, which is that when you have systems of only two particles, so they're isolated, you have only say two particles, which might be different and they are interacting, but in the case where the interaction depends just on the distance between the two particles, like in a central potential, uh, the simplest example is a hydrogen atom, uh, where you have the electron and the proton, since the potential um, depends on the distance. Uh, well, this is a two-body problem in quantum mechanics that, uh, as you probably know from your previous course in quantum mechanics and the hydrogen atom uh, problem, uh, this can be reduced uh, to a basically free particle problem uh, for the center of mass plus a central potential case uh, for one particle where you work with the reduced mass and the, uh, the, sorry, <laughs> the coordinate that is related to the displacement uh, uh, between particle one and particle two. So, I mean, this one can be reduced also to basically um, uh, one particle problem due to the fact that it's a central potential. So, okay, so far so good. This is basically the case of uh, different particles. However, uh, the topic is about identical particles. And the reason we're making this study is because the case of identical particles is fundamentally very different in quantum mechanics than in the classical case. So when you consider many identical particles in quantum mechanics, when you say, well, they are identical, and they are indistinguishable, but they're literally indistinguishable. It's not the same as in the classical case where let's say that you would have like two billiard balls yet uh, in a pool game, but each one of the billiard balls has a number, right? Or a color. And so you can distinguish them. You cannot do that in quantum mechanics. They are literally indistinguishable. So you, can, you cannot put any index or label or distinction by color or any other means when you talk about identical particles in quantum mechanics, they're literally indistinguishable. And there's no mechanism that you can use to distinguish them if they are identical. So this is a difference um, from classical mechanics uh, due to the fact that you can distinguish between uh, identical particles. Um, so, well, uh, we're going to start by studying first a simpler case, which instead of like n identical particles, just two identical particles. Okay. And we're going to define an operator, which uh, we're going to call the particle exchange operator, where basically it's going to act, let's say, on the wave function, right? Describing two identical particles. So for the moment, f is any function like that. And the particle exchange operator is basically going to exchange particle one with particle two. So if this was a function of x1 and x2, when you apply the particle exchange operator, when one goes to two and two goes to one, you have f of x2 and x1. And let's say that we apply a second time the particle exchange operator. The procedure looks abstract, but you'll see why it's very useful and very elegant. So I'm going to apply the particle exchange operator twice, right? which basically it's like as in a game of ball where you go one and two, two and one, and then one again. So you're gonna return again to the same state, right? If you apply the first time, because I mean, this applied two times, so you can decompose in P of this. So basically the first application has already exchanged particle one and particle two. And the second application will put them back in the original order. So you return to the original basically expression of the function. And so this means that because basically this particle operator is squared uh, for one and two returns to the original state, it means that the eigenvalues of this operator are basically one. So um, again, the effect of applying the particle exchange operator twice is returning to the original function. So it's eigenvalues one, 
But at the same time, we know that this is the square of the particle operator that we defined. So basically this eigenvalue one is the square of the eigenvalue of the particle exchange operator by itself. So that means that by taking uh, basically square root, uh, the only possible solutions are that the eigenvalue of the particle exchange operator is basically plus one or minus one. So this is why this method, although it's a little bit abstract, is very elegant. So if we were to consider the related eigenfunctions, given that we know the eigenvalues of the particle exchange operator, that means that, okay, they are either symmetric for the case where the eigenvalue is plus one or anti-symmetric um, in the case where, uh, sorry, I got distracted with an email. Um, I'm sorry about it. Yeah, the emails pile a lot. Sorry about that. So let's return to where I was, right? So we discovered that the eigenvalues of the particle exchange operator are plus one and minus one. Um, so for the case where the eigenvalue is plus one, it would mean that basically for this eigenfunction, the application of the particle exchange operator uh, leaves you with plus the function. So the same. So that's why this case is the symmetric case, right? Uh, basically, when you apply the exchange operator, it leaves the function the same way. And so even with an exchange of coordinates, the function stays the same, and this is the symmetry or the symmetric case. In the other hand, uh, for the case of the particle exchange operator uh, where the eigenvalue is minus one, um, you'll have the uh, basically anti-symmetric case where look, the particle exchange operator is gonna exchange the particles and you end up because you have the eigenvalue minus one with minus the function. So this is telling you that under an exchange of particles, the function acquires a minus sign. And there is a name for this and it is anti-symmetric, which distinguishes from the symmetric case where the action is just to get a positive sign. Uh, so these are basically the two possible types of eigenfunctions of the particle exchange operator. And so um, I guess this, uh, it's clear, I mean, of which um, symmetric function you could propose for two uh, particles, at least in theory or abstractly, but what about anti-symmetric functions of uh, two particles, right? So how can we propose it? One simple example is a determinant. You may have seen that it has this um, sort of anti-symmetric properties, but if not, I'll explain why. So let's say that we have two identical particles, right? And we want to propose an anti-symmetric wave function, which precisely satisfies this. But essentially, when you exchange particle one with particle two, you end up with a minus sign. So what about the determinant? So uh, what you'll have is a wave function representing only two particles, then you'll have um, a normalizing constant so that the norm squared of this is one, etc. And then you have the determinant, um, which basically in a given row, for example, you'll have uh, um, uh, basically function one and function two. And for each column, it is related to basically the coordinates of particle one and the coordinates of particle two for the second column. If you were to do this, um, well, by the two by two rule for determinants, you will have this, right? And what you know is that the determinant it changes uh, by a negative sign when you exchange uh, rows or columns. In this particular case, if you were to exchange particle two with particle one, effectively what you would do is to exchange these two columns. And so you would, if you were to apply the particle exchange operator, you would get a minus sign and you would satisfy the anti-symmetry requirement. So again, the rows uh, are related to basically the functions that you're working with individually for individual states. And the columns are um, related to basically column one, particle one, column two, particle two. And so you're satisfying the anti-symmetry requirement by properties of the determinants. 
And uh, basically, just if we normalize the determinant appropriately, uh, this is providing a good candidate for an eigenfunction of the particle exchange operator. So, uh, well, the symmetric case is simpler because, I mean, look at this form, right? If you basically had a minus, uh, instead of a minus sign, a plus sign, this function is quite symmetric. If you exchange the roles of uh, two and one by applying the particle exchange operator, you end up with the same function. So this clearly satisfies uh, basically that when you apply the particle operator to the function, you get the same function. So this is precisely the symmetry requirement that you need. Okay, at this point, this has been a little bit mathematical or very abstract in terms of the systems of the particles, but here is where the physics comes and it motivates the kind of math we have said before. So this is because one of the postulates of non-relativistic quantum mechanics is that there exist only two kinds of identical particles. So they can be either, either of the types of fermions where the fermions have anti-symmetric wave functions of their exchange of a pair of particles and they have half into their spin or the case of bosons, which are uh, basically symmetric wave functions uh, on their exchange of a pair of particles and their spin is integer. So these are the only two kinds of identical particles that you can have, right? Um, I mean, of course, there are fermions of different kinds and bosons of different kinds. Uh, simply speaking, well, fermions are usually the particle elements and um, bosons are the actors of the field. And sometimes where for composite systems where do you have uh, basically uh, systems of um, say two different particles like the hydrogen atom, which is an electron plus a pro uh, proton, uh, which kind of um, particle or the system you have depends basically on considerations on their spin and how they act together. But anyways, um, a slight comment is that, I mean, in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, this needs to be a postulate. But in the relativistic quantum mechanics case, you don't need the postulate because uh, neither on the spin or the anti-symmetry because this is just a consequence of uh, relativistic invariance and is derived like that. So, but we are in a non-relativistic quantum mechanics course. So let's talk first about this one. And we'll talk uh, mostly speaking first about systems of many fermionic identical particles. And then we'll talk about the systems of many bosonic identical particles. Uh, another comment, which is very nice and very interesting is that Basically, since now uh, we know that uh, the systems of identical fermions are represented by anti-symmetric wave functions by postulate, we can prove the Pauli exclusion principle for systems of two fermions. So the Pauli exclusion principle states that two identical fermions cannot occupy the same state. And this holds basically due to the anti-symmetry and particularly for the form of the determinant that we propose for fermions. Because let's say that they had the same state, right? So basically we would be in the case where the function psi one would be equal to psi two. And in that case, if you were to validate this determinant, basically you would have the case of a uh, determinant of a matrix with two equal rows. And in that case, you know that the determinant vanishes. If you were to do the computation, essentially you would have, um, well, it would vanish uh, directly, right? You have the same term basically products of psi one times psi one, one applied to x one and the other to x two. So it's clearly equal to zero. And I mean, in this case, it's because of properties of determinants. And you would interpret this by the fact that the amplitude of the probability of this situation is zero. So effectively, they cannot occupy the same state because the probability of that event would be zero. So just to finish the summarization of this, um, Examples of fermions are electrons um, for which we know that uh, the Pauli exclusion principle applies. And examples of bosons are photons. Uh, phonons are uh, another example of bosons. And then again, uh, I wanted to make the comment that the composite particles uh, systems like atoms, which are made of an electron and a proton, for example, in the case of hydrogen, uh, 
um, they are fermions with bosons uh, depending on the total spin of the system. So the case of composite particles uh, takes a little bit more time to analyze, but okay. And at this point, we haven't talked about spin. So just keep in mind that for the moment in these considerations, I have not considered spin. We'll consider it later on in one of the next lectures. But um, basically, the way you consider spin in many cases of utility cannot be applied to all, but in many cases, you do some sort of separation of variables as well. And uh, you consider the spin separately. And this would, what we have seen so far is basically the spatial part or we have neglected the spin up to a point. Um, so it's all, well, useful in many cases. We haven't mentioned it yet, but I'll explain that later. So the approach I'm gonna have with this, uh, at least with uh, this first lecture in the module is that um, there are many problems of theoretical interest in Griffith's exercises. And so, because I would usually personally um, include them in part of the lecture to be presented, I'll be solving these uh, sets of theoretical problems on the go because they're important for the class and for, your, for the understanding. So, uh, in this uh, comparison between the different and identical particles uh, cases, uh, there is a problem that I consider important, which is 5.4, and it has two different cases. The first one is that uh, let's assume that for the case of two particles, you know that the functions psi1 and psi2 are orthogonal, and they are both normalized, meaning that you have essentially an orthonormal set. And uh, for the case of identical particles, what is the constant A in our equations above? So basically, you have already uh, found the functions that have anti-symmetry or symmetry up to a constant and you want to find the normalization constant A. So the solution is the following. And I'm gonna do both the fermionic and bosonic case at the same time by considering simply a case of plus minus. Of course, the plus is for bosons so that the function is symmetric and the minus is for fermions so that the function is anti-symmetric. So we just have to find A for these cases. And again, the proof or how to find A is just by normalization. And we have assumed that this set is orthonormal. So in this case, what you have, um, well, you have that the norm squared of the functions will be one, right? Okay, so you can pull out the constant and basically you'll have norm of A squared and then you'll have the other part, right? So uh, basically plus minus inner product with plus minus this other. What you're gonna do is to simply apply a linearity in this component, say square linearity in this component, and consider that basically, okay, this case and this case will have a plus sign. When you consider this case with this case, you'll have also a plus sign because this would be plus plus, minus minus equal to plus. And the other case is basically this one with the, um, sorry, this one with this one, and this one with this one will give you plus minus sign. So at this point, it's just apply brute force for inner product you pass the um, norms uh, squared of the other, um, well, this, this constant to the other side, basically because you know that it's not zero and you just want to develop this term. So you have the plus minus, plus minus and plus for this due to the reasons I mentioned. And you basically, well, you have a systems of two particles which you have to perform them to integrals and um, you'll decompose uh, these cases basically by the variable you're integrating, you're kind of applying for Venus theorem. And so that's why you can split the integral separately uh, by basically separating the variable. And um, yeah. So the first case is very simple because, well, you'll have uh, psi one inner product with itself. So that is one times psi two inner product with itself. So that's one. I think this one integral is over the coordinate uh, x1 and the other over the coordinate x2, but never mind. So for the plus minus cases, what you have is the following. So in the decomposition, you have psi2 inner product with uh, psi1 over the variable x1, but you know that the functions are orthogonal. So this will be zero, uh, like what's the others here. For the other plus minus case, a similar situation happens. Essentially, uh, basically you have uh, psi1, uh, inner product with psi2 um, for x1 and it's zero. The other integral is zero as well for the same reasons when you integrate over 
x2. So the plus minus terms vanished, essentially. And the last case, which is a plus because you have uh, plus minus times plus minus, it's basically in the coordinate uh, x1, uh, you uh, take inner product of uh, psi two with itself. And for the coordinate x2, you have psi one with itself. So that's one times one. So effectively you have one plus one, which is equal to two. And that's equal to the inverse of the norm of a squared. So if you basically invert back, you have that norm of a squared is equal to one half. And up to a phase, basically taking the square root and thinking of a without phases, a would be equal to one over the square root of two. So you have already found the solution up to a phase. Um, so basically our symmetric and anti-symmetric functions for bosons and fermions, in the case of two bosons and two fermions, it's basically normalized by one over the square root of two. And you have your sum of plus minus, plus for bosons, minus for fermions. And this is the solution to the first part of the problem, which is nice. Well, the other case is, um, Let's think of a different case. Let's think that um, in this case, the functions uh, psi one and psi two are not orthonormal, but actually you have that psi one is equal to psi two and uh, this function is normalized. And so what's the value of A? Of course, this uh, case can only occur for bosons because for the case of fermions, we have already proved that Pauli exclusion principle implies that for fermions, when you have this psi one equal to psi two, basically the probability of that event is zero. So we don't consider that case. Um, so let's assume that we have then bosons. And in this case, uh, for two identical bosons, we have the normalization constant times uh, the sum of this. So basically you have um, uh, psi one x1, psi one x2 plus uh, psi one x1, psi one x2 because psi one is equal to psi two. And well, these are basically the same function. So you have uh, twice this function. So adding them, you have two times a times uh, psi one of x1, psi one of x2. And again, we'll use normalization. So basically, um, well, this event can happen. So it has, um, well, basically a non-zero probability. And then norm squared of this function for two identical bosons where the states are the same for each one of them, um, basically, you have norm squared equal to one where you have, well, can pull this term out um, of the inner product. So you have four norm of a squared and then uh, this times itself. And what you'll do is again, basically think of this, this is an integration on the coordinates dx1 and dx2, but you can separate variables because you're working now with this product the state. Um, and uh, well, separating basically x1 coordinate from x2 coordinate you have uh, psi one times itself in inner product and uh, psi one times itself in inner product for the coordinate x2. So this is four a squared or norm a squared times one times one. So four norm of a squared is equal to one and you basically have to invert. So norm of a squared is equal to one fourth and up to a phase a is equal to one half. So you, for this particular case, uh, the constant uh, would be a equal to one or two when psi one is equal to psi two. So, okay, so far so good. I have made the introduction. Basically I have presented the difference, broadly speaking between different and identical particles and presented fermions and bosons for systems of two particles where the wave function um, has to be anti-symmetric for fermions and symmetric for bosons. So um, we're gonna go deeper in the differences between distinguishable particles, let's say in quantum mechanics, because they're different, and identical particles, which cannot be distinguished uh, for two particle systems. So, okay, well, let's do one D example means basically one D imposition. So don't worry too much about it. And yeah, we'll uh, notice the difference between basically different and identical two particle systems. And Basically, we're going to assume that the particles either different, therefore distinguishable or identical, and therefore non-distinguishable, um, can be in basically only two states. So uh, state A or state B, and well, one particle, uh, because we have two particles, uh, 
one particles will be in state A, the other in state uh, B. Which one, which we don't know. And in quantum mechanics, we'll never know. There's basically, that's the problem of the distinguishability, right? So, I mean, we only have probabilities for the outcomes related to that, essentially. So we are also gonna assume that uh, the state uh, Psi A is orthonormal with respect to the state uh, Psi B. And uh, again, when let's say the particles are different, they are literally indistinguishable. Sorry, distinguishable, uh, I apologize. I mean, they're different. Let's say they have different mass so there's a way to distinguish between one of the particles by assumption. And well, in this case, we're actually allowed to say that, for example, particle one is in the state A. And as we saw at the beginning in the introduction for um, different particles, because they're distinguishable, uh, they admit the description in terms of product states to represent the system. So let's say that in this case where we know like, um, particle one is in state A, the system would admit a product state uh, form of psi A x1, psi B x2, right? So if particle um, one is known to be on state A, then particle two has to be in state B. Uh, let's assume that they are uh, distinguishable because they can be different. So let's go now to the different cases of identical particles, right? If there are bosons, they have a symmetric uh, state function of this form with the plus and the square root of two normalizing. And for fermions, the wave function is anti-symmetric. And uh, well, you have a minus sign also normalized by square root of two. Now, we're trying to basically get to the essentials of the difference. And we're gonna do so by considering uh, the difference in expectation of the squared distance between these two particles. So what we're gonna do is we're, we're gonna validate the expectation average of the following observable, the square of the difference between x1 and x2. And okay, we're in a 1D problem. This is actually very simple. And if we simply expand by squares, this is basically x1 squared expectation average plus expectation of x2 squared minus uh, double the expectation of the product of x1 and x2. And um, okay, so let's do the computation of these expectation values for the different cases. Now uh, let me take uh, first a couple one mm, and we'll proceed. So look, for the case of distinguishable particles, um, where let's say that uh, it admits a description of a product state, where for example, particle one is in state A and particle two is in state B, we simply have to plug in um, to compute the expectations. So the expected value of X1 squared under this wave function, uh, basically you plug in this form and well, notice that this operator, it's uh, just related to coordinates of particle one. So you can separate the integral by Fubini's theorem and basically just perform the integration of X1 related to X1 coordinates, where you have the expectation just over state A because particle one by assumption was in state A. And this other that considers the coordinates X2, uh, it's basically inner product of uh, Psi B with itself. So this is one, and this is simply the expectation of X uh, squared under a state A. Because at the end of the day, well, this has been reduced in individual particle case. The particle coordinate is acting as a dummy index. So, I mean, it doesn't matter if you did the computation for uh, over coordinate X1. At the end of the day, what matters, since this has been reduced to the case of an individual particle, is that this is the integral of x squared under an individual state of uh, psi a. And so this is remarked as the expectation of x squared for an individual particle case where the index a is, or the subscript, it's indicate that this expectation is computed over the individual state uh, psi a. Likewise, uh, for the same reasons, if you were to do the expectation of x2 squared, uh, you start here you notice that this is only related to coordinate x2. Uh, you'll decompose by Fubini's theorem 
This is inner product of uh, Psi A with itself for X1. So this is one. And then you have a Psi B of X2, uh, inner product with X squared of uh, Psi B of X2. So this is only an integration over the X2 coordinate. And this is basically the computation of, or the expectation of X squared of an individual particle that it's in a state of Psi B. The domain index doesn't matter too much because you're performing integration. And the subscript is indicating that this is for um, uh, state B. The expectation is computed over the state uh, Psi B. So last but not least, uh, you need the expectation of X1 times X2. So you have this, and in this case, actually, you can also do separation of variables, but um, well, basically over coordinates uh, X1, you'll have the expectation of X1 under state Psi A. And for X2, you have the expectation of this observable under state uh, Psi B. So this is what this is representing, right? I mean, in a way, the coordinate um, for particle one and coordinate of particle two disappear uh, because you are using them as dummy integration indexes or integration variables. You just have to distinguish that uh, one of them was for uh, state A and the other for state B. Um, so when you compute the observable of interest, which is the expectation of uh, the square of the distance between X1 and X2, you plug in your results and you have expectation of X squared under individual state A plus expectation of X squared on the individual, under, sorry, on the individual state B minus two times uh, X under state A, expectation of X under state B. And well, I mean, there, uh, there is also some, I don't want to abuse the word symmetry, but basically if we had instead of uh, Psi equal to Psi AX1, Psi BX2, uh, the situation where basically particle one would be known to be in state B and particle two, therefore in state A, you would have the same result basically because you will exchange A with B in this account and you'll have the same. So you would have the same answer. The point is that for the cases of particles distinguishable as for example, the case of different particles where if they have say different mass, they can be distinguished. Um, uh, you are allowing a product state uh, description as enough for the description of the system in some cases and following from that description, you would have this result. That is not gonna happen for the case of identical particles because identical particles in quantum mechanics, since they cannot be distinguished, they have very strict descriptions of their wave functions into symmetric or anti-symmetric functions. So that's the difference. And at the end of the day, we'll see the effect of that in the consequences of evaluation of this uh, observable, which is basically indicating basically the average of the square of the distance between particles. So you'll see that there's a difference and that difference can be interpreted physically. So what you have is that for the case of identical particles, you can actually do the computation for bosons and fermions at the same time by allowing a plus minus where the plus is for bosons and the minus is an index for fermions, right? So other than that, they have almost uh, the same description, but I mean, has an effect on the function and in the symmetry or anti-symmetry. So let's do the computations of each one of the uh, observables of interest. For X1 squared, yeah, I mean, you have inner product of the uh, wave function of interest um, with itself um, and you have the normalizing constant. If you take them out, basically you have one half and then you simply have to do again basically inner product and linearity, linearity in this argument, anti-linearity or c-square linearity in this argument, but at the end of the day, I don't have complex constants. So I'll also have some linearity in this case because it's a real constant you know, plus minus one. And uh, some features of what we did before in a previous exercise is still hold. Meaning that, um, well, you decompose the cases, right? So basically, well, Okay, you first do um, separation by uh, linearity in the first component due to the fact that it's a real constant. Then when you do the second, you have basically the plus case. 
this plus case because it's again plus plus minus minus so in the two cases it's a plus and then you have plus minus and plus minus which are coming basically from the multiplication of this with this or this with this so the thing is that um, for the different uh, cases you're evaluating um, x1 squared so it depends only on coordinate uh, x1 and you can separate the integrals again and basically um, okay the expectation of x1 squared will be carried in the x1 coordinate uh, for the first case you were in state a um, in this other this is one because it's uh, uh, inner product of psi b of x2 by itself then you have the case for the plus minus where um, psi a of x1 is inner product with x1 squared of psi b the other case actually actually we don't need to compute this and this is the point because the functions are orthogonal so uh, for the other term you have psi b of x2 with uh, psi a of x2 and you're assuming that they are orthonormal so um, well this would be zero for the same reason when you do the other decomposition you have for the plus minus case psi a of x2 inner product with psi b of x2 so this would be zero and um, well, it doesn't matter what the rest is. Basically, you apply linearity, you then apply Fubini's theorem to compute um, this expectation of interest. And some of the terms are zero by orthogonality. The other case, which is non-zero, is precisely the other plus case where, well, what you do is to compute expectation of x1 squared in the state of psi b. And the other coordinate, which was separated by Fubini theorem, uh, it's basically in a product of uh, psi a by itself, so this is one. Um, so, um, well, the plus minus cases are again zero, and you have the expectation of x squared under state a, and the plus expectation of x squared plus, uh, under state b. Now, the reason we have removed the x1 coordinate is not only because it's a dummy index, but this is basically computation over individual states, right? So this would be the result if basically I was or just to consider one particle in a state A. And we have the factor of one half. So this is the, um, basically one half of X squared under A plus X squared under B. Um, if we had done the computation of X two squared, the same situation would happen. It's exactly the same because you divide Basically, you separate by coordinates and uh, you carry on the computation under particle two. Still, you would get the same. Um, so the remaining expectation is the one that needs to be computed, which um, it's basically the expectation of x1, x2. So this is going to involve all the coordinates. So um, that's not an issue. Um, we'll simply keep it in mind. And some considerations still hold. Basically, you have the one half by computing the product of the normalizing constants. Um, then you'll have basically x1, x2. You can still apply uh, linearity and anti-linearity, which becomes linearity because you have a real constant. Um, then what you'll do is for the different cases where you, again, you have plus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus. Um, you will consider the different cases, right? And so you have x1 and x2. And that means that you're gonna, again, uh, separate the integrals. But for example, in this case, x1 uh, is performed over coordinate um, uh, x1. And expectation of x2 is performed over coordinate x2. So you have applied Fubini's theorem, but you won't have a situation as simple as this inner product uh, uh, of the function by itself as you had it in the other cases, because now you have all the variables in the expectation of the given observable. So in any case, for the first case, basically you have the expectation of X1 under particle A times the expectation of X2 under particle B. And so that is reflected on the fact that then you have expectation of X under state A and expectation of X under state B multiplying each other. Um, in this case, the terms won't vanish as easily, actually, um, because, okay, now you have mixed things, but you cannot use orthogonality because you have basically an x-coordinate in the middle. So let's see what we get. 
So we have plus minus psi A of X1, uh, inner product of X1 uh, of uh, psi B of X1. So um, the point is that we have basically done separation of variables. The coordinate becomes a dummy index in this case, and this can be easily written at basically the expectation of X in a one deep or one particle problem of uh, psi A of X with psi B. And likewise, the other, right? Because the rest is basically psi B with X of uh, psi A. So these two are multiplying each other. And what you'll get um, might seem a different case, but actually you'll get the same term. It amounts to the same because you have plus minus, now psi B in X1, uh, inner product with X1 of psi A, uh, which is by removing the dummy index, uh, it's basically an expectation of an individual state of uh, psi B inner product with X of uh, psi A. And the other is basically psi A uh, X uh, psi B. So again, once you have separated the variables of integration by Fubini's theorem, you can express them in a simpler way. And the other is actually, okay, the plus case or the other plus case, psi B of X1 uh, of psi B times uh, psi A in a product with X2 of psi A. So these are simply the expectations uh, of X under state uh, psi B times the um, expectation of X under state A. And you have repeated states, right? Because actually, well, this is the same as this and the plus minus are actually the same. Psi A, X, Psi B, Psi B, X, Psi A. So that uh, balances with the factor of two in the denominator and you simply have expectation X under A times expectation of X under B plus minus uh, this matrix element. This is basically the matrix element of X um, um, for A, B index multiplied by its conjugate actually, if you remember the properties of Hermitian operators, etc. So, well, this is uh, a matrix element multiplied by its conjugate. So it's gonna be basically the norm of the matrix element squared. And we can actually introduce a notation. Uh, this is just notation. If we define um, basically XAB, which is simply the matrix element, um, basically what you have is that the expectation of X1, X2 is equal to expectation X under A times expectation of X under B plus minus the norm of this matrix element squared. Um, so now we have all the elements of the observable of interest and we're gonna do the computation, right? So basically uh, what we were caring about was the expectation or the expected value of the square of the distances between particle one and particle two. Algebraically, we'll have this. So this happens for all cases. We just have to plug in the result that we got under the identical particle cases. And we distinguish between bosons and fermions with a plus and a minus. So the first one, as we saw, we basically got, um, uh, well, this one, right? Uh, so for X1 squared, it's one half of X squared A plus X squared B. And likewise for X2 squared, so when I add these two, uh, basically these two, I actually get uh, simply X squared under A plus X squared under B, so which is this part. So I just have to plug in minus two expectation of X1, X2, which is what I got in here. So I plug in the result under this notation, uh, minus two XA times XB plus minus uh, norm of the squared of matrix element XAB. And um, well, the minus affects the plus minus by making it a minus plus. So you have X squared under A plus X squared under B minus two um, XA, XB minus plus two uh, norm squared of X uh, AB. Um, so um, the result is slightly different. And so I'm gonna repeat what I, we just got for the different cases, um, which is the following. Um, let's say that returning to the case of distinguishable particles, and we're gonna add a subindex D for distinguishable. Uh, 
the expectation that we got for the observable of interest, which was the distance between the two particles squared, was this. So this is the result, uh, expectation of x squared under A plus expectation of x squared under B minus two um, x A, x, it almost looks like uh, basically expansion of squares, right? Um, well, but for the case of identical particles where the minus is for fermions and the plus is for bosons, in this index, so plus bosons minus fermions, this expectation was, uh, if we go to what we got, uh, first we repeat it, right? So this part, x squared under A plus x squared under, under B minus two x A x B, but we get an additional term, which is minus plus two norm squared of x A B. So this would be almost the result that we got for the case of distinguishable particles, right? The functional form of this is the same as for the distinguishable case. And the difference is precisely this term. It's the minus plus two norm squared of X A B. So basically we can give the following interpretation to this result. So notice that what we're evaluating is basically the square of the distance of the two particles between the three different cases. When the particles can be distinguished and when they cannot for the subcases of either fermions or bosons. And so what is clear, well, let's assume for the moment that uh, XAB, this matrix element is not zero. So identical bosons are gonna be closer in average than distinguishable particles, why? Because the boson case, which is a plus, has a minus in here, and this is a non-negative term. So, which we're assuming that is not zero and therefore it's uh, basically positive and with the minus for the bosons, uh, which uh, bosons had a plus, so this has a minus, this would be negative. So the expectation of the square of the distance is smaller than in the case of distinguishable particles because for distinguishable, you would only have this. So for the case of bosons, kind of like the in average, their distance is reduced. So they're closer on average for this case of two bosons. And on the other hand, for fermions on average, meaning when we compute this expectation, when we have a minus sign, that becomes a plus in here. And so the distance for two fermions is actually an average greater than for the case of distinguishable particles and also by uh, basically, obviously for the case of uh, bosons, right? So for fermions, actually you have a plus. So the expectation or the in average, the square of the distance is greater for the case of fermions. Um, so the fermions are on average farther away uh, than the case of distinguishable particles. Um, so this is the intuition. This is a very remarkable result because we're getting this just as a geometric effect of the different cases of distinguishable and identical particles based on the form of their wave function and symmetry on anti-symmetry requirement for fermions or bosons. Um, but most importantly, well, there's a, a slight um, second interpretation of uh, the fermionic case, which is that in a way, Pauli exclusion principle is not letting you to have them in the same state. So uh, that's kind of like what it's undergoing when they're being separated to each other. But uh, this explanation suffices. Basically the result is that on average, bosons are closer than distinguishable particles and fermions are farther away than distinguishable particles. So now, what is important in the assumption, excuse me, is that XAB, this matrix element is not zero. Because if it was zero, basically there would be no difference between the cases, right? So the reason I pointed out is because there are non-trivial cases in which actually this can be zero. And notice what this is, right? So this is a matrix element of uh, the operator X so basically you have X, uh, sorry, Psi A inner product with X of Psi B. But well, I mean, this is um, position observable, which is easily integrated in position space. And um, if you had no overlap between the wave functions Psi A and Psi B, meaning that the reason, for example, in the particular case where they were orthonormal was because uh, psi A is zero in the region where Psi B is non-zero. So trivially they are orthonormal, but also this interval would be zero simply because kind of like the particles are too far away in these two states. 
well, this um, term would vanish. And actually, this is a justification of why electrons with non-overlapping wave function, let's think of, uh, well, not a Gaussian, but one of these truncated parabolas, right? Um, uh, where basically the support or the region where each one of these parabolas is non-zero is different. So they are orthogonal, clearly. And then this integral will also be zero because it's always having a zero factor in the different regions in the space. So uh, that's also a justification of why electrons with non-overlapping wave functions uh, can be thought of as distinguishable because the effect is the same in a way. Um, but well, there's also non-trivial cases where uh, this matrix element is non-zero. And they are important, or these are important cases because there is an effect precisely due to the either symmetry for bosons or anti-symmetry for fermions on the average distance between the two particles of the system. So, which is what I just said. Bosons are closer, fermions are farther away than distinguishable particles. So this is not a force because, I mean, think about it. I mean, at this point, we have not made any assumption about an interaction potential of any kind. This is just in a way a geometric consequence of the symmetrization or the symmetry or anti-symmetry of the wave functions for bosons and fermions. Um, there is uh, on average this attraction effect between bosons and a repulsion effect between fermions. And so these effects are quantum if you think about it simply because they are derived from the symmetry or anti-symmetry requirements for um, identical particles in quantum mechanics. And uh, they are described in the literature as exchange forces for simplicity or for intuition, although everybody knows that it's not a force, properly speaking, but it's just a geometric effect. Um, again, uh, please hold on with me regarding spin. Uh, I have ign ignored it, but later on I'll make some considerations piling up uh, on what I have presented. So, um, yeah, I mean, the... The last part is basically to present a problem of theoretical interest to, uh, to the course, which is uh, the following problem from Griffiths. I mean, I would have included as part of the theoretical content on the lecture, but we know that uh, Griffiths has a different style, etc. So the problem is the following. Uh, and well, I also want to help you by basically doing essential problems in Griffiths uh, so that you see what's the mechanism to solve them and have practice. Uh, if you notice, I have tried to include more uh, problems with both theoretical and practical interest in the lecture uh, to get you used uh, with the hands-on approach and to get you started and help you. So let's say we had the three particles, one in the state uh, Psi A, the other in the state Psi B, and the other in the state uh, Psi C. We're going to assume again that, uh, so now we have a system of three particles, not two particles. And uh, we're going to assume that these are orthonormal, uh, these uh, state functions. And the goal of the problem is to construct a three particle state uh, uh, function representing in case one, distinguishable particles, uh, let's say, because they're different maybe, in case two, identical bosons, and case three, identical fermions. I'm still reading the statement of the problem. The solution is below. But it's also indicated that, that to keep in mind that the case two of bosons must be completely symmetric under exchange of any pair of particles. And three, the fermions uh, must have a basically a wave function that uh, must be completely anti-symmetric in the same sense. Um, there's also a comment indicated that basically it's a hint of the problem that there is a cute trick for constructing completely anti-symmetric wave functions which is the so-called later determinant, which is uh, simply a normalized determinant for wave functions of different particles. And the first row would be, so this is a good hint, and actually they're giving you half of the problem already. Uh, the first row is uh, Psi A fx1, Psi B fx1, Psi C fx1. So the first row is basically having the different uh, states, but for the same particle. The second row is related to the second particle, considering all different states and et cetera, and so on. And this device works uh, for any number of particles indeed. In fact, that's uh, where I intend to end uh, this lecture to consider the many uh, particle wave function uh, for identical fermions. And another footnote, which is uh, not directly observed in the textbook until you click on that, 
it's basically the following, and I include it because it's very useful. That to construct a completely symmetric configuration, you can use the permanent, which is basically a permanent is almost like a determinant, but you don't uh, include minus sign. So where you have a minus in a determinant, you include a plus. So, okay, the solution for a three uh, identical particle case has been already um, sketched by Griffiths um, with the hint. Uh, one is actually pretty easy. Uh, distinguishable particles, it's an easier case because we know that they can be represented by product state. So maybe they're distinguishable because they're different, but the crucial aspect is that when particles are distinguishable in quantum mechanics, uh, in that situation, you can actually say, because you can say, well, particle one is in this state and particle two is in this other state. They allow description of the form of, it's not the only description because you can change A, B, and C, but basically particle one in state A, particle two in state B, particle three in state C, and so on. This is possible. Or the other, right? Maybe particle one in state B, blah, 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 all that stuff. But the important thing is that for Distinguishable particles, a product state might be enough for the description, might be. The difference with identical particles in quantum mechanics is that a product state is not enough and you must satisfy symmetry considerations and you cannot have this as a good candidate of the wave function for identical particles. So that's where you need to introduce symmetry considerations. So remembering the hints, I'm gonna do actually case three first because it's the most direct given the hints. So let me present first the case of identical fermions. So I'm gonna use the comment of Griffiths, right? And so they told us that we can use a determinant to basically satisfy anti-symmetry requirements. And I'm gonna remember how determinant is defined uh, in two different ways uh, for three by three matrices. Uh, one of them um, is basically evaluating it in terms of two by two matrices. Um, so, which all these formulations are equivalent. So we're gonna propose the so-called Slater determinant. Um, the Slater determinant means uh, that basically you apply to state functions and you have a normalization constant that I'll explain at the end. Uh, for the moment, just forget um, this constant. Just, I'll just comment on it at the end. But okay, I'm gonna use exactly the same thing that was given, right? Um, first row is uh, Psi A, x1, psi b x1, psi c x1, exactly. So first row is different states for basically particle one. Second row is related to particles two uh, in different states. And third row is particle three in the different states. So I'm gonna make a couple comments. The actually original definition of the determinant, you may have not seen it or maybe you did, but it's basically a sum over permutations where you have a sum of a permutation where for each permutation, you take the products. So the permutation is basically over the indexes where you basically change one to one tree. It's basically um, uh, bijective mapping between the indexes one to three onto themselves. So let's say three to one or uh, two, three, one. But uh, basically a permutation is like for the first slot, you have the possibilities of three, two, and one, and you choose one, right? So for the second slot, you are now only have two possibilities and you choose, and then the last one is completely determined. Never mind. Uh, the point is that you have the sum over permutations over the indexes, then you have uh, the product of psi i uh, evaluated in the coordinate, uh, particle coordinate uh, j i, where j i is precisely defined by the permutation. So, um, and then later on, what you have is the sign of a permutation which is basically what is explaining um, the plus and minuses appearing in the determinants. But when you uh, basically, for example, instead of having this, you had uh, psi b x1, psi, um, no, sorry, I want uh, something like this. Basically when you exchange like two elements, you get a minus sign, etc. But anyway, this is a very theoretical definition of a determinant of properly speaking is the original one and you can have equivalent uh, representations. In fact, when you have three by three matrices, precisely the equivalent representation is uh, expanding by rows or columns of determinant. And if you were to actually do it by, uh, um, by rows over a given column, let's say that I will start with this term, right? 
So um, this would be plus minus plus, so a plus sign, psi c and the determinant of the minor, which is what I have here. Psi c of x1 and then this times this minus this times this, which is including this element. Then you have a minus of uh, psi c of x2 of the determinant of the minor, which is what you have psi x1, psi bx3, minus psi x3, psi bx1. And then you have a plus of psi cx3, uh, the determinant of the minor, which is psi x1, psi bx2, minus psi x2, psi bx1. So this sign of the permutation is precisely um, this stuff uh, that is popping up. If you were to fully expand, essentially, um, like computing this times this minus this, and this times this minus this, then you have minus and then plus for this, and then this times this minus this. Uh, you would see that the plus and minuses are precisely related to the sign of the permutation, because in all cases you have basically C, A, B, one, two, three, or some permutations. So this is following precisely this definition of the determinant. And the square root of six, uh, which is basically three factorial, um, it's uh, to normalize by permutations. So anyways, just to concretely express this, uh, the sign of this, which can be either plus minus minus one is the sign of the permutation, which is defined by the permutation itself. Again, this is an alternate, very technical or theoretical definition of the determinant, which is actually pretty useful for high dimensions, unless you want to do the expansions in terms of minus, but that might be a little bit of a pain in the ass. Um, so, I mean, given the properties of determinants, basically that, look, this row is related to particle one, this row is related to particle two. So what we want is a function that basically isn't asymmetric on their exchange of particles, meaning that if we were to exchange, for example, this row with this row, we would get a minus sign. And that's actually guaranteed by the properties of determinant, which is precisely the reason we have proposed a anti-symmetric wave function, this Slater determinant. So the, because the determinants take a minus sign of their exchange of two rows or two columns, we are satisfying the anti-symmetry. So th this is a pretty good candidate and that's why we propose this later determinants for the cases of two particles, three particles, and particles and that are fermions, which are identical and must satisfy anti-symmetry. So, um, well, uh, before I consider the constant, let me go to the um, case of the identical bosons. So using the footnote, which was to construct a completely symmetric configuration, use the permanent, which is same as the terminal, but without the minus sign. So now it's clear what I want. Basically in this definition, I will ignore the sign as all cases are positive, which reflects on this case as having basically plus wherever I have a minus. And so the case is very simple. So now, it admits the uh, definition very formal of the permanent, where I have again, well, normalizing constant, sums over permutations, uh, where again, I have sums over products. Um, basically, um, psi is, let's say, in a state uh, one, two, three, et cetera. And uh, R is acquiring basically um, the coordinates of the particle under the permutation. So I went to state Ji, et cetera but I don't have a minus sign. Or for the case of three by three matrices, this is actually a simpler description because basically I have to consider all different cases, right? So I don't have any minus, I only have plus for the boson case, uh, psi c, x3, psi x1, psi b x2. And basically if you think about it, what is considering in this other term, so we know that basically, um, well, <laughs> we're evaluating all possible cases precisely because we cannot know. We can only estimate with a given probability. If particle three were to be observed in the measurement in a state C, there are two options. That particle two is in a state B and particle one is in a state A, or the particle one is in a state B and particle two is in a state A. That is what is being presented in these cases. And likewise, in a way, in the fermionic case, the difference is that for bosons you have plus but now it's clear how these permutations are considering all possible cases or so for the case of bosons. So at this point, I mean, it's clear by triviality uh, that basically this is a symmetric function. Just imagine that you exchange basically X2 with X1 and you'll get the same because all cases are being considered. Here it wasn't asymmetric because 
when you exchange rows, you get a minus sign and you satisfy anti-symmetry for fermions. And the last part is precisely why did I put this normalizing constant, right? So, um, well, um, this is the thing. What you're considering precisely is the permutations, right? Of different cases um, in particle. Okay, particle, let's say one can be in one of the three states. Once you think or you measure, for example, that it's in a state, you still have two options for particle two to either be in one of the other two states. But once you define these two, then particle three is completely defined in its state. So that's basically a permutation problem. And if you think about it, when you compute, uh, this is following from normalization, but if you compute the inner product of uh, this psi or this psi with itself, um, what is gonna happen, uh, just in a way as we did for the two particle cases, is that you'll analyze basically all possible permutations. And well, um, if you were to compute the norm squared of this, this constant would be squared and you would have basically one over three factorial. And if you remember basically three factorial, it's basically three times two times one. So it's basically analyzing the possible permutation cases where in the first slot for let's say particle one, you have three possible states, state A, state B, state C. So then once you have defined that because the order is important in this case, then you have uh, basically the other options, right? Uh, then particle two can be either, let's say that we pick the state C in particle one. So particle two can either be state A or state B. So that is three times two. And then particle C is defined. That's precisely what is happening with the factorial. Three factorial, three times two. So it's analyzing all possible permutation cases. And so it's again, uh, square root of three factorial. It's simply a normalization constant for the three particle function. So, and also it's following from orthonormality. If you remember the case of two particles, we use the normality with the banishing of the plus minus terms uh, by inner product. So again, this constant, the one over square root of three factorial, uh, it's basically uh, satisfying the role of normalizing the probability uh, when squared of by how many different permutation cases you'll have of particle blah, 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 and state blah, blah, blah. So one last um, consideration is, um, uh, yeah, so, okay, I did this example for a purpose. So I already solved the case of distinguishable particles that they admit at least a product state, identical fermions and identical bosons, considering all the hints. And the reason I chose this problem is not only because it's partly of theoretical interest, but also because it makes much simpler to think what would be the extension of a system of n identical particles for either fermions or bosons. And so this is where I'm gonna end the lecture today. Uh, I'll comment more on this uh, next time, but well, look, for basically anti-symmetry of the many particle wave function of identical fermions, you have the following. So let's think that you have a system of n fermionic identical particles, right? And again, the wave function must be anti-symmetric on the particles change of two um, fermions in this case. So again, we'll need to have a normalized determinant. Um, um, we can express it as this determinant of its or its transpose. Uh, so actually now what is gonna happen, this is just a notation thing, it's not too important, but in this case, uh, my first column is gonna refer to particle one, my second column is gonna refer to particle two and etc. And my nth column is re referring to particle n. So I have an n by n matrix uh, for which I have to compute the determinant. Columns are related to particles and the rows are considering the different states, right? Um, basically, row one is in state one, row two is in state two, etc. So I mean, it's clear how I'm extending the definition for two particles to n particles, precisely because determinants take a minus sign when you exchange to different rows or to different columns. In this case, because I'm having different columns for uh, different particles, I'm gonna exchange two columns and I'm gonna get a particle, sorry, a minus sign on the particle change. Um, I'm gonna write, formally the definition of the determinant uh, instead of 
I'm not going to do the expansion because it would take a lot of time and it would be very cumbersome, but I can write the formal definition of the determinant uh, for an n by n matrix. This again, the sum of permutations, when you have the indexes from one to n mapped uh, by means of uh, basically uh, an injective uh, or bijective map uh, to one over n, so to themselves. Um, and it's a sum of permutations of products of uh, psi uh, i, where i goes from one to n, and the coordinates are basically um, being evaluated at the um, particle index uh, given the permutation. And then I have the sign of the permutation, which um, again can be a plus or a minus, depends on how, basically depends on the permutation. If the permutation was almost identity, but let's say you have n particles and you leave almost all in the same position except one and two, where you change one and two with two and one, you have a minus sign. And basically, because every permutation can be decomposed into exchanges of uh, basically one particle with each other, you simply have to take an account of piling up how many minus indexes you have on these small decompositions into one particle to each other. So this is very abstract. I mean, this is actually part of a linear algebra course and a definition of determinants, uh, a little bit more theoretical than um, necessary at this point. But at least I want to define it because I will need this definition for the case of uh, bosons uh, excluding these minus. But never mind. Um, so again, the matrix uh, elements are psi i of rj uh, in this uh, expression. So this is the matrix where i is representing basically orthonormal functions for individual particles and j is representing a particle index uh, for rj, uh, j equal one to n. So this is just the same, right? I mean, uh, columns, uh, different columns in this case are different particles, rows are uh, states. And uh, yeah, I mean, this is the formal definition. The sign of the permutation can be either plus minus or minus one defined by the form of the permutation by itself. Again, this is a very general theoretical definition of the determinant. And uh, yeah, it's formally equivalent to the row expansion calculation of matrices of higher dimension. So, I mean, in fact, this other is uh, derived uh, from the original definition, but they are formally equivalent. And uh, yeah, uh, the reason we choose the determinant is because the determinant changes sign under a row or column exchange. So it's a pretty good candidate for basically um, particle change um, uh, so to satisfy the anti-symmetry requirement uh, for basically fermions or a wave function of many uh, fermions. Um, yeah. Um, and yeah, the one over square root of n factorial is again a normalizing constant. The argument is precisely the same. Think of it when you take a, a inner product of the function with itself, norm squared, you have one over uh, n factorial and n factorial is precisely considering all the permutations, right? n uh, possibilities in the first slot, uh, n minus one possibilities in the second slot and then you have n times n minus one, blah, 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 blah. blah. So that's why you would have n factorial. So this is normalizing by all cases. Again, we have assumed that uh, these functions are orthonormal. So many of the plus minus cases will vanish as it happened in the two by two case. So, okay, we are very general. And this is the reason I presented the problem of three by three because actually now with the previous knowledge and this expression, I can attempt also to define the symmetry of the many particle wave functions of identical bosons. So now for the case of bosons, I have identical particles, which must have a symmetric uh, wave function. And uh, yeah, I mean, they must be, this function must be symmetric on the particle exchange. And it's gonna be basically a sum of permutations, but without this sign. So, and it's gonna be normalized again because I'm considering all permutation cases. Um, it almost is gonna look like a determinant except that it doesn't have negative signs. So what I'm gonna do is precisely use this definition of uh, determinant, but taking out the minus sign to get everything very symmetric, right? Again, this is basically, again, a permanent and the same way Griffiths indicated that the previous problem could be extended to uh, many n particles. I'm exactly doing that. So I'm using the permanent for n particles. And basically this is normalized by permutations accounts. And this is the sum of the permutations of the products from uh, one to n of psi i 
of uh, RJI, where uh, JI is basically the mapping of I to another index in the permutation. I don't have a minus sign, so this is basically a sum over all permutations of the exchanges between uh, indexes, uh, between particles and states. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, it's pretty clear that it's going to be very symmetric because I simply have a sum of all, all possible cases with a plus sign normalized. Uh, so this is going to satisfy the symmetry requirement. Again, I uh, is an index for functions of orthonormal functions, and I'm going to include ji represents a particle index. Uh, um, well, okay, yeah, no, I'm going to leave it like that. I think this is enough, and it's clear that this is basically the map of the permutation. And again, the factor one over the square root of n factorial intends to normalize by taking account of different permutations because when you take in a product of this with itself, you have the square. So you have one over n factorial and n factorial is n times n minus one, et cetera, et cetera. So it's again, considering the normalization by cases where you have n uh, possibilities in the first uh, particle times n minus one in the second uh, times uh, minus two, et cetera. And you get the n factorial. But yeah, uh, I think it was helpful to um, do this problem, which is partly theoretical, because from the three uh, identical particle case, uh, both for fermions and bosons, it's very clear how to extend this more complicated case to the end particle case. So we have touched into the symmetry of the many particle wave functions of identical fermions and bosons. I will probably extend more on this and um, uh, but for a moment, I think I explained in detail um, a good amount of the situation for two uh, particles, uh, which are identical for fermions and bosons, and lay the foundations for uh, in, um, um, basically a many particle uh, fermionic or bosonic systems. So yeah, some references, of course, Griffiths. Um, I'll probably use McIntyre later on. Uh, for this topic, uh, my own set of uh, lecture notes when I took quantum mechanics and also a linear algebra textbook that uh, explains the abstract definition of the determinant for n by n matrices in more detail. So uh, hopefully you like the lecture. Um, please study the material. Good luck with the homework on the weekend and see you very soon.